Colorado schools are adding more armed resource officers. We should probably talk about whether they really reduce school shootings. Immigration agents considered filling an empty prison on the plains with ICE detainees. Speaking of empty spaces, you see those Halloween stores popping up already? How in the world does that work? They're open three months a year and closed the rest of the time. And Colorado's new head poet is a voice we know here on Next. When we talk about school shootings, you will hear people say, well, if only there was an armed officer at Columbine. There was. You'll hear people say, if only there was an armed officer at Stem Highlands Ranch. There was. If only there was an armed officer that day at Arapaho. There was. Now, there are also armed school resource officers who have stopped shootings. Our new show Roy takes a closer look now at whether there is real research on this. Everyone's goal is the same here, to make a classroom feel safe. Right. But when Erica Manawaddle with Colorado Children's Campaign started researching school resource officers, she said she didn't find a lot of information. It just means we don't have a clear picture at all of what that, that intervention does. Just this month, Douglas County Schools decided to add seven new SROs this upcoming school year, a decision made a few months after the STEM school Highlands Ranch shooting. And there was also a state school safety committee briefed about SROs two weeks ago. That's where Manawaddle told lawmakers the research she found is conflicting. In some settings, the presence of an, a school resource officer led to or was associated with a decrease in school violence and kids felt safer. Um, in other settings, they saw the opposite. For the time being, she thinks money should go towards more programs backed by evidence. In school mental health uh, services, positive behavior support. They're able to prevent bullying from occurring where they can stop a student engaging in risky behavior and tell John them John McDonald, okay. who heads the Jeffco School Safety Department. It's community policing at its very best. Says he's seen the evidence backing up SROs himself. I've seen SROs uh, prevent suicides, mm -hmm. climb up on buildings uh, when a kid is ready to jump, and talk that student down. Manawaddle says the reason there is so little research on SROs and school shootings can feel counterintuitive, but it's because statistically school shootings are rare, but when it happens, it feels anything but. So it is really important to point out that the Douglas County School Districts did set aside money to go towards mental health programs, and there's also a new law that was signed this year that expands a program for more health professionals in schools. So, Kyle, just one part of a much larger picture when it comes to addressing school safety. And when we talk about why there isn't good research on this, Anusha, again, we come back to the fact that folks don't always want to hear, mm -hmm. but it's the fact that these things are so rare when they do mm -hmm. happen. There's not a big set to study. Yeah, I mean, when you're researching, you need data, and if it's not happening as maybe often as it feels like it's happening, mm -hmm. it, it makes it a lot harder to research. does not diminish the kind of emotional impact it has, though. Without question, and of course, that's why everybody's paying such close mm -hmm. attention to this. Thank you, Anusha. ICE's overflowing immigration facilities are an American disgrace. The Trump administration even says that what's happening right now is unacceptable. The disagreement is over how to fix it. Well, now we know that ICE was eyeing an empty prison out in Hudson where they could have housed detainees, detainees years ago, but it never materialized. And if ICE wants that empty prison in Colorado today, they wouldn't tell us. ICE toured the facility in Hudson in 2017. This was first made public last night by Danielle Jeffers. She's a staff member at the DU Law School. We followed up with some open records requests today and got town emails that show that, yes, in fact, the private prison's operator, GEO, was the conduit for immigration agents' interests. But then the whole thing appears to dry up because ICE didn't have funding in 2017. Later that year, more emails show that the operator was trying to lease the prison beds to the state of Colorado. We're trying to hold some other state's prisoners here. That thing is still sitting empty in Hudson. The operator, GEO, told us today they have no plans to reopen the prison. ICE wouldn't talk about whether they're interested in moving detainees out to Hudson. So we try to keep track of Denver's endangered places for you. Old buildings that are at risk of demolition to make way for whatever is new. And we could fill a city block with all the updates that we have for you tonight. The city's Landmark Preservation Committee is not going to step in to save the old dairy farmhouse in North Park Hill. The owners of that old brick house at 36 and Grape want to be able to demolish it. It is one of the last remaining signs of the dairies that used to dot Park Hill before the city was built out that far east. 
The Landmark Preservation Committee does want to protect Tom's Diner at Colfax and Pearl. They are calling it historic. That decision came down today and it keeps developers from building condos there. City Council has to approve the decision in order to make it a real deal. The owner wanted to sell the property to fund his retirement. Denver's buildings, historic or otherwise, are made of brick and stucco, wood and memories. Developer wants to tear down the chapel at Tennyson 46 and put up some townhomes. One man drove all the way down from Dillon to talk to us about it. He feels that strongly. He told our Lori Lizarraga when he looks at that chapel, he sees his dad. This is him doing the uh, the work on the ceiling right there. That's my dad there. My name is Mike Smith, and I'm not sure what my title is here, but my dad did it. <laughs> my dad was a plasterer, and he's the one that did all the plastering on the inside. He is a member of the plasters union right there. That's, that's the thing. You know, he went to work is what he did. I and mean, he came home and he was a good dad. Well, you're looking at the chapel inside as it was built and finished when it was finished. This is one of the first pictures of it as finished. The thing of it is I'm not anti-development, okay? I am not, okay? Because I know development is going to happen regardless of what we can do. So we don't need everything new, okay? We need to keep some of our history. And this is a history in North Denver, and I was raised here. I know what effort went in here. It's not something that somebody can come and re replace, okay? It's historic. Well, you know, I think he'd sit down and say, you're doing what I trained you to do, okay? You're standing up for us because we, these things mean something to us. Some people feel you can't stand in the way of progress, but progress doesn't mean destroy everything in the interim. The Landmark Preservation Committee has a public meeting to discuss what to do with that chapel. It's coming up on August 20th. A face and voice that's familiar to next viewers has become Colorado's new poet laureate. We told you about Bobby Lefebvre's play, North Side, the story of gentrification in Denver as he has seen and felt it. Today, Democratic Governor Jared Polis announced that Lefebvre will be Colorado's new poet laureate. It just means that for the next four years, he's going to go around being an advocate for poetry, literacy, and literature in our state. It's an official title for what Bobby already does. The poet, and more importantly to me, the poet laureate, should not only strive to raise the consciousness and appreciation of the promotion, consumption, and reading and writing of poetry, but they should also strive to raise the consciousness of our collective psyche and heal where there is hurt, celebrate where there is joy, share where there is peace, disrupt where there is stagnation, build where there is opportunity, fight where there is conflict, and challenge where there is complacency. Everything the man says sounds like a work of art. He was selected from a pool of 20 applicants. Our recommendation tonight comes from Next Digital producer, Erin. She was fascinated by an article in the No Outdoors for the Denver Post. It explains the story of an extremely rare mushroom that grew in southern Colorado in the scar of the Spring Creek Fire. These fire morals, these mushrooms flourish right after large wildfires. That's what they did down near La Vida. There's even a Facebook group dedicated for people who like to go out looking for them. You can find an article or a link to that article on the Next Facebook page. Too early. The Halloween stores are setting up already. It's an interesting lesson about the economics of empty spaces. And the most Colorado thing we've seen today. Spinning around with it, dancing with it. You never see bears do that kind of stuff. It's a good lesson for some other people who don't know how to Colorado. That's next.
I think the only thing more grating than that one cable channel that plays sappy Christmas movies in July is seeing Halloween stores pop up around town already. It is too early for this, people. Our Marshall Zellinger went to find out why empty retail spaces are already in costume. Really? I'm always skeptical when they pop up. I mean, really? I think it's a little bit too early, man. I mean, it's I mean, it's like 100 degree heat still. That might explain the bright orange glow from the signs promoting the store that celebrates something 100 days from now. Well, it's kind of early for Halloween, but you never know. The people are always starting early. Thinking about back to school is bad enough right now, but Halloween? It's a little bit unusual to think about Halloween in in uh, in July. Landlords are getting relief from empty storefronts at this Denver shopping center off Colorado and Mexico. This Aurora strip mall at Hamden and Chambers and this Lone Tree big box location near C470 and Yosemite where these two apparently got inside early. I kind of wonder what do what do these retailers these strip malls do all the rest of the year to fill that space. Take this Aurora location, for example. Google shows it has a history of being empty. A real estate broker tells me Spirit subleases this space for a few months from a tenant who's stuck in a lease. I mean, it says that the real estate market over here maybe not so great, the commercial real estate. <laughs> we reached out to Spirit, but did not get an answer today on a number of real estate questions. But according to the company's website, the ideal location is an empty store, 5,000 to 50,000 square feet, in an area with a population of 35,000 or more living within three to five miles and 25,000 cars driving by each day. When I set out for this story today, I really thought I was going to learn that these empty storefronts year round like to be empty because they get paid hand over fist by spirit for those three months. But Kyle, that that turns out not to be the case. There are a lot of the situations where someone just can't find someone. They're stuck in their own lease. Mm -hmm. Hey, sure. Give me three months worth of rent and we'll take care of it. I feel bad for the Aurora, Aurora location across the street. There is a year-round costume store that now they're competing. Oh, that seems like a poor real estate decision. So, so Spirit, I don't, they're not the airline people that, that make you like pay for the oxygen in your seat and stuff like that. No, 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 no. Okay. It's funny, I was looking up who to talk to from their corporate office and I was surprised to learn they're owned by Spencer's, the Spencer Gift store oh, from the mall. Oh, we went there to the mall when we were kids. Oh yeah. Yeah, well that's fun. Good to see them still doing well, kind of. All right, thank you, Marshall. Beautiful summer day in Colorado. Warm today, mostly sunny with temperatures at 90 degrees. We just popped up from 87 to 90 and will be about that number again tomorrow. Compliments of high pressure, which has pushed the storm track to the north, allowing for warm desert air in. There is just enough moisture that we're seeing isolated storms pop up. Storms that have one inch diameter hail and heavy flooding rain around Woodland Park and Divide. These storms are tracking quickly to the south and have a history of producing damaging wind and also a lot of lightning. Most of the activity along the Front Range foothills and across the Continental Divide where we expect that moisture to remain tonight. Tomorrow, a slightly better chance that some of these storms may bring a brief rain shower to Denver, but kind of a nice pattern, pretty typical with morning sunshine and then those late day storms. So in the city for tonight, little rumble of thunder and then the storms are out of here. Our low at 61 sunshine and 92 tomorrow with a 20% chance of storms. Better chance of rain from storms Thursday and then again on Sunday, but not a big heat wave scenario playing out this week, which I think we're all happy about. Our governor and New Mexico's governor can't quit their little border war and coexisting with wildlife is easy if you know how to Colorado. Walked away hungry, but there's always, uh, you know, there's always fish right up in the lake. We'll take a look next.
If you want to avoid having your actions featured on That's Not How You Colorado, just read the signs. The sign says, no garbage here due to bears in the area. That would mean no garbage next to it either. Martin Sebring saw this mess at a gas station in Winter Park. People's stupidity and carelessness putting bears' lives at risk. You think nothing of it, but I'm telling you what, it is no good. Now contrast that sad scene with what we saw up in Lyons, where people know that this is space we share with bears. This also doubles as the most Colorado thing we've seen today because it's a cannabis dispensary that was bear aware. It's just, it's a really fun town. It's not too much of a party town, but it's just relaxing. Tucked along Highway 66, just north of Boulder. The community is great. Everybody knows each other in the community. Lions sees plenty of strangers. Oh yeah, with SS Park right up the street and with Planet Bluegrass right over there, we get everybody from around the world coming through. But in this small town, you still have to be mindful of your neighbors. Okay, cool. Last thing we need is... Uh, Nico Garza knows it. <laughs> One of our furry friends coming out to say hello while we're doing an interview. Okay, we're safe. So what happened? So, yeah, what he did was came through, ripped this guy right off the hinges. This lock right here. <laughs> His neighbor. Oh, the dumpster. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> headed straight for the dumpster. I mean, saw the same video you saw. It was crazy. Colorado Parks and Wildlife says this black bear was looking for food last week. This bear wasn't shy. He uh, ripped open that door. And broke through that fence. He could even give you a shot to zoom in where he, uh, where he did the damage. But only walked off with a locked dumpster. Spinning around with it, dancing with it. You never see bears do that kind of stuff. All on camera. Now, the bears are uh, very romantic out here in Lyons. They credit Garza and his colleagues at the Bud Depot. Yeah, so definitely. For using a bear-proof dumpster and making sure it was locked up. Walked away hungry, but there's always, uh, you know, there's always fish right up in the lake. Now that, that's neighborly. We don't run the show. We have to coexist with nature. For next, for bear -proof lock. I'm Chris Hansen. So you've heard smarter than your average bear. Well, apparently the average bear is actually quite astute. Colorado Parks and Wildlife says bears will intelligently seek out sources of food. You are not going to fool them. Protect your trash, your grill, your dog food, your bird food. And you know, it's not just a mountain thing. Bears wander down here along the front range too. So let's keep them alive. A few of you have been asking about the random voice on the DIA train. They hold this big competition to find the new voices. It's Alan Roach and our own Kim Christensen and some random dude. But we told you that that was the airport testing out new messages designed to get us to behave on the train. They worked. So Alan and Kim are going to record them. The doors are open. That random guy you heard is an airport employee who DIA used to test out the new lines. And they say that those new messages appear to be helping passengers stop standing mouth agape in the doorway while the rest of us are trying to get onto the train. Move to the center. It's not rocket surgery. So DIA had staff riding the cars. They compared videos. How do people react to the new messages? How do people react to the old messages? And they say the passengers actually followed the new instructions. Move to the middle, take off big bags and that sort of thing, make room for other people. So keep an ear out for Kim and Alan on those new lines soon. The shade of the day comes from some of our neighbors tonight. That and your feedback next.
It's been a while since we uh, noted the shade of the day, but it's hot, so we're grateful for the shade provided by New Mexico Governor Michelle Lujan Grisham. The governor shared some photos of New Mexicans who came up to Colorado to teach grocery workers here how to properly roast chilies. She and Governor Polis have been properly roasting one another for weeks now over whether the Pueblo chili or the Hatch chili is the superior chili. I'm just saying, Colorado, I don't know if this is a fight we want. Jared tweets in about a good old fashioned Western Colorado butt kicking. He says being from the Western Slope, I can confirm. It involves two guys yelling at each other as they walk in opposite directions. I love that. See you next time.